Learn to code, build apps, inspire the next generation. Welcome to the Swift App School podcast, where we are empowering the next generation of app developers. I'm Charles Long, co-founder of Swift App School. And I'm Bob Williams, co-founder of Swift App School. Okay, welcome to episode eight of the Swift App School podcast. Today, we have our very first guest, the one and only Guy Kawasaki, the creator of the world's best podcast, the Remarkable <laughs> People podcast. <laughs> wait, wait, it's episode eight and I'm the first guest. What did you do for the first seven? Yeah, the other seven has some really good stuff, but it's all techie stuff. Oh. It's, all techie. it's just us rambling on. <laughs> okay. So I'm, I'm the first guest. Wow. Yes. We will do a formal introduction here for people who don't know who you are. Uh, Guy Kawasaki is the chief evangelist of Canva. He is an executive fellow of the Haas School of Business, UC Berkeley, an adjunct professor of the University of New South Wales. He was a chief evangelist of Apple and a trustee of the Wikimedia Foundation. He has written Wise Guy, The Art of the Start 2.0, The Art of Social Media, Enchantment, and 11 other books. Kawasaki has a BA from Stanford University, an MBA from UCLA, and an honorary doctorate from Babson College. And Guy, we're delighted to have you on the podcast as our first guest. So you are our Jane Goodall. Jane Goodall, I know, was your first <laughs> guest. So <laughs> just wanted to say that Listen, up front. I'm no Jane Goodall, <laughs> and Daniel Quayle is no JFK. But yeah, I get it. <laughs> yeah, so we have a lot of questions for you. So we're just going to dive right in. And uh, you go. First, first question, what do you think your high school self would think of the person you've become? Oh, <laughs> you got any easy ones to start off with? So let's think about this. My high school self wanted to be in high tech, although back then high tech was an electric typewriter, not a manual typewriter. I had certain expectations of who I would marry, which I have exceeded. And let me try to insert some wisdom into my answer, which is with almost total certainty, most of what I have become is not what I thought I would become. So for example, it never occurred to me that I would be a writer. Of course, it never occurred to me I would be a podcaster because there was no such thing back then. But even as old as I am, there was writing back then. So I didn't anticipate being a writer. I did not anticipate being a public speaker. I did not expect to be quote unquote an influencer. And so, yeah, there were influential people before back in the 70s. Uh, 1970, not 1870, but, you know, not like Kim Kardashian kind of influencers, but, you know, there were people who were, you know, highly visible and you aspired to and bought the products they endorsed. So basically most of what I have become was either not anticipatable because such a position didn't exist, or it just never occurred to me that I would ever, ever be good enough to do some of those things like make money writing. What was your proudest moment as an Apple evangelist? Oh, my proudest moment as an Apple evangelist. There are so many because that was just a wild, unbelievably remarkable ride. Denting the universe, making history, changing the world in mean, all the old yarns we want to apply with the first position at Apple as a software evangelist. My job was to convince companies to make Mac products. And you know, it took longer than I thought, it took longer for Macintosh to succeed than I thought. But there's no question that we influence computing, user interface, et cetera, et cetera, in a humongous way. So I, I'm just proud to be part of that tsunami. And my second stint at Apple, um, depending on who you ask, I played a pretty important role in keeping Apple alive so that it could be a trillion dollar company where I own no stock. So um, that's very satisfying that I think if you're old enough and know enough, you probably would recognize that I had a hand in keeping Apple alive. Tell me about the Macintosh. Just your experience with the Macintosh. I mean, it's just so iconic today. Yeah. Well, let me say that the Macintosh was a religious experience. So now, first of all, personal computing to begin with was a religious experience. So back when I was at college, the state of the art was a electric typewriter. 
And if you were super duper cool, you had an electric typewriter with white lift off tape so you could backspace over the mistake and pull it off. Most of your audience is scratching their heads like, now what is he talking about? But anyway, there's a little piece of white tape and you backspace and you typed over your error and it lifted off the ink. That was, that was quote, <laughs> editing. And so um, you used to use a typewriter or you paid a typist and you bought um, the kind of stationery that you could use a pencil and erase typing in there. It's one of those things. And then I got to use a word processor and an Apple II and oh my God, the oceans parted, right? So going from typewriter to word processor, that is a whole new world. And then when I saw Macintosh, this is in 1983, you know, Macintosh at the time, the two kind of stellar apps were Mac Paint and Mac Write. So Mac Paint enabled you to draw, to spray paint, to create rectangles and triangles and squares and circles and fill patterns and all that, none of which you could have done on the existing personal computers. I mean, back then you had to use the X's and O's and try to make it into something. Uh, yeah. And the, and then Mac Wright had multiple fonts, multiple sizes, integration of text and graphic, what you see display, what you see printing. So once again, the scales were removed from my eyes. So it was truly, truly a religious experience. Um, describe one of your favorite memories during the early years at Apple when you were working with Steve Jobs. Well, that's a trick question because let me tell you something. Well, watching him introduce a product is also a religious experience. But generally speaking, I will tell you that I was scared of him. Uh, he was very intimidating. You know, clearly, he, he, he was using a different operating system from most mere mortals. And so, um, you know how there's a great body of HR theory about how you should meet with your employees, create mutually acceptable goals, focus on the positive, provide reinforcement, uh, educate, take the high road, blah, blah, blah. Steve Jobs did none of that. He just scared the crap out of me, scared the crap out of everybody in the division. And so contrary to classic or not classic, but contrary to, to current HR theory, fear works as a motivator. And I had a tremendous fear of being humiliated in front of my peers by Steve Jobs. And that drove me to do some of the best work of my life. Now, for those of you listening to that, this is not me recommending that you become a heinous kind of leader. I'm just telling you it worked. And now it worked if you're Steve Jobs, the odds of someone listening to this being the next Steve Jobs are not too high, let's just say. So, uh, you know, don't, don't think that because Steve did it this way, it's the only way, the best way, or the right way. It is a way that happened to work. We also live in a different climate than we did at that time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I would. That's a mild understatement. <laughs> although, although, you know, it, the, the underlying message there is you can't get away with that stuff today, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. Well, I would make the case that Elon Musk gets away with it every day. Uh, and so I think Elon Musk is probably as close as there is to a living Steve Jobs. And, mm -hmm. and Elon Musk may even accomplish more because if you think about it, Steve changed personal computing. He changed handheld devices. He changed cellular phones or telephony. He changed retailing. So he changed app stores, you know, that kind of thing. But Elon, he's drilling tunnels. He's going to Mars, or at least he's saying he's going to Mars. He's making solar panels. He single-handedly forced the car industry to go electric. He's using rockets over and over again, not, you know, use once and dispose. He's putting up, I don't know, 30,000 satellites so people anywhere in the world, including Ukraine, can have internet access that's not dependent on something working on the ground other than power. And so you could make the case that Elon Musk may dent the universe more than Steve Jobs. So we were actually lucky enough to be at the Moscone in 2011 for Steve Jobs' last keynote for WWDC. So 
Anyway, when he died, we were at the Adobe conference, and I'm just wondering if you remember where you were when you heard the news. Not at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I have, I know, I know where I was when JFK was assassinated. Yeah, I know when. That's how old I am. I know where I was when 9/11 happened. I was standing yeah. in the London Business School. I cannot tell you. I know where I was when Steve Jobs died. And yeah. Some of that is because. You know, we all knew he was sick and it, it was going yeah. to happen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Whereas you finish a lecture at the London Business School and you look at the TV and planes are crashing into buildings. You know, <laughs> that wasn't part yeah. of the plan. It wasn't like, right. okay, it's going to happen. Like, it's just a matter of time. And yeah. JFK getting assassinated also that, you know, wasn't in the plan. Yeah. So I think that was it. So uh, I hate to burst your bubble, but I don't know where I was. I, I was curious. Uh, so how do you honor him today and, and how you live your life? Well, that's a framed question. How do you know I honor him? <laughs> <laughs> hey, well, Bob made that question. <laughs> that was well, on me. I certainly try to attribute a lot of what I learned to Steve Jobs. Things like getting to the next curve, not just doing better sameness. Things like not being able to ask your customers what they want because they're just going to tell you better, faster, cheaper what they're already getting. And thinking about, you know, you should hire people who are better than you, not worse than you so that you look good. So these are things I ascribe to learning from Steve Jobs. So in that way, I hope I honor him every day. I, I would not be where I am were it not for Steve Jobs. There's no question in my mind. All right, last Steve Jobs question. Uh, what do you think Steve Jobs would have thought about the coding initiatives from Tim Cook's Everyone Can Code movement? <sighs> um, you know, at the time, was, Steve was involved with HyperCard, right? And so HyperCard yeah. is kind of the same thing. It's empowerment of programming and controlling the device. So I, I would think he would support that. But Again, in a rare moment of humility, let me just say that I cannot tell you what Steve Jobs would think about anything because he's just a few orders of magnitude beyond me in intelligence, vision, et cetera, et cetera. So I am a mere mortal. <laughs> it's like asking a fish to describe what it's like to be an eagle. Not even just a fish, like a scum sucking bottom fish explaining what it's like to be an eagle. <laughs> so what do you think of Tim Cook's initiative with Everyone Can Code? You know, <laughs> I hate to admit, this is the first time I've heard of it. <laughs> okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. You know, like right now, my relationship with Apple is I stand in line in the Apple store and pay full retail just like any other schmo. It's not like <laughs> Tim Cook is calling me up saying, hey, guy, what do you think of this? What do you think of that? And, yeah. you know, can I send you iPhone 16 prototype yet? I mean, <laughs> I'm just another one of the millions of people who are paying full price for whatever Apple. I just and I should just give Tim Cook my ATM bank card and say, leave me enough to eat. <laughs> That's how it feels to That's me. Too. Like, that sounds like that sounds familiar. <laughs>So what is the greatest piece of advice you would give a teenager today who's interested in learning to code, learning a programming <laughs> language like Swift, or pursuing a career in tech? Well, I, I need to zoom back a little bit, and maybe you won't like this advice because I don't think, well, are you saying everybody who's listening to this is going to be a programmer, has figured that out yet? No. No? Okay. So um, my advice is that, first of all, you hear a lot of people saying you need to find your passion, pursue your passion, you know, get deep into your passion. And I think that that is a disservice. I think that is a disservice because people who have not yet, quote, found their passion are thinking, oh, my God, what's wrong with me? I'm 18 years old. I haven't found my passion yet. All my friends have been taking violin since five. They've been taking calculus since four. They started a foundation. You know, they already have a exhibit in an art gallery. And look at me, I'm just trying to play football and, you know, date girls, or I'm trying to play, you know, I don't know, soccer and date boys or whatever. Right. And so I think that does a disservice. And I'll tell you, I'm 67 and I discovered my true passion at 65. 
So, which is podcasting. So you could say, you know, guy, you kind of wasted the first 65 years of your life. Well, even that's an overstatement. But I think my point is that don't look for the P word, look for the I word. And the I word is interests. And so you should pursue things that seem interesting to you. Podcasting may seem interesting. Programming may seem interesting. UX, UI design may seem interesting. Music may seem interesting. Surfing may seem interesting. And so you try a bunch of interesting things throughout your life. And if you're lucky, a few of them will truly become passions. So the question is, well, how do you know when an interest has become a passion? And I learned this from a guy named Mark Marin, who wrote a book that I cannot say the title on because you told me not to swear in this podcast, but <laughs> I know the one you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> and he told me that, first of all, I want to say that shiitake is a kind of mushroom. It's not a profanity. <laughs> yep. Let's just establish yep. that up front. Okay. Yep. So the lesson I learned from him interviewing him in my podcast was that, you know, you're on to something when it involves eating a shiitake sandwich and you enjoy it because that's the test because if you're in a perfect world you'd enjoy doing something that's really valuable and it's easy and blah 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 well this ain't a perfect world and if you talk to any accomplished musician artist programmer whatever there's aspects of these professions that are shiitake sandwiches. But if you're willing to not only do the shiitake sandwich, but love the shiitake sandwich, that's when you know you've arrived. So for me, for podcasting, there's about two to four hours of research for every interview. Then there's the interview itself, which is, let's say, two hours. And then there's two hours of my editing, two hours of somebody else editing, and then five hours of sound design. And so for an hour of a Guy Kawasaki podcast, I've put six or seven hours, probably there's another 10 to 15 hours per hour. And for me, the kind of shiitake I'm doing for my podcast is I take out the filler words. I take out, there are a lot of people when you're on a podcast and you're recorded, they start off a sentence like, um, uh, yeah, but yeah, well, and I take out every because I can't stand it. And there are a lot of podcasters who just press the record button and off you go, but not me. So I spent hours editing and I sometimes cut parts of my question out. And there are times where people say something so funny, I just laugh over them. So I, I separate the tracks and I take out my laughter so that people can hear what the person is saying. I mean, there's a lot of stuff going on in my podcast. And so I love that stuff. And I love editing when I write. So that's why I know that, you know, these are two shiitake sandwiches that I'm just eating with <laughs> mustard <laughs> relish in a brioche bun that's toasted. I mean, I just love that stuff. Now, early on in your podcast, I think you talked about some software that you used. Yes. Uh, to take out the ums. Yes. Are you still using that? Yes. Okay. This software product is called Descript. And what Descript does is awesome, which is it enables you to upload the, the sound recordings transcribes them automatically and it now gives you text and so now you can select the text and tell descript to ignore the text or delete the text you can shorten things and you do all of this in text and then it ripples back to the audio so i select the word um i delete it now the audio doesn't have the word um which is about a thousand times better than trying to like carefully move the cursor to just capture the sound wave. Um, I don't know how I would podcast without this grip, honestly. I really need to start using it because I edit the podcast and it's so bad that my five-year-old daughter, almost five-year-old daughter says, you forgot to remove that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, I hate to tell you, but she's right. <laughs> All right. So what do you think the leaders at Apple are doing right today and what are they doing wrong? Oh, well, first of all, let's just be honest, right? So I never built a trillion dollar company. What do I know? 
<laughs> you know, uh, Tim Cook, I salute you, man. I am not worthy. I am not worthy. You know, don't listen to me. Now, if you press me and you wouldn't have to press me hard, what don't I like about today's Apple? And I'm really a product guy. And so there are things that I just, I cannot understand and I think it shows a lack of empathy. It also may show a lack of true understanding on my part. So, for example, I would be happy to have a slightly thicker iPhone if I could have better battery life. Because frankly, I'm probably going to buy the battery, you know, thing that you're going to attach as a case with a battery in it anyway. So if I just wanted a thin phone... You know, okay, but I want a thicker phone. If if you gave me a choice, thicker phone or longer battery, guess which one I will take. That's why I buy those humpback things. Now, um, one of my particularly favorite subjects is the amount of ports in a Macintosh. Okay, so what what you're what I'm using right now is the latest iMac, and there's about four or five USB C ports on the back. So let's just look at my setup here. So I have one connection going to the camera. I have one going to my mixer. I have one going to my keyboard because I don't want to have to pair and charge a keyboard. And then I have a Wi-Fi printer, but I also have a label printer. So I have a dongle. And oh, by the way, that doesn't count when I want to download photos from a DSLR or video from a GoPro, which needs those two little SD or micro SD. So my expensive iMac has a dongle. And unless I'm blind, my expensive iMac doesn't have an earphone jack. And the dongle doesn't have an earphone jack. So I got to buy a little $29 thing that goes, you know, regular jack to USB-C. And when I use my MacBook Air, I swear there are times where my dongle has a dongle. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, so wrap your mind around that. My dongle has a dongle. Yeah. Like Steve, what happened, Steve? <laughs> like, what? How, how is it now? To Apple's defense, maybe ninety nine point nine nine percent of the people, all they ever do is stick one thing in that USB C port, which is the charger. Okay. I grant you that. So maybe statistically I'm wrong, but I got to tell you, man, most of the people I deal with, they want an SD card reader. Yep. They want, you know, USB-C. They want USB-A. They want an earphone. They want MagSafe because it's very useful to know that your computer is charging without having to open it up and looking at the lightning bolt, right? So that kind of stuff just drives me crazy. I swear, if Apple said, and they kind of have done this with the MacBook Pro. But if Apple said, oh, I can't do it with John Ives English accent. I wish I could. But, you know, I'm I'm being completely sarcastic with if Sir John Ive were still there and he said, oh, we've we've had a revelation at Apple. And this is the new revolutionary MacBook. And we decided that people need more ports. And there are a lot of USB-A devices around. So we put in USB-C and A. And people take pictures, not just with their phone. There's these things called digital cameras. Oh, my God. And so we have a SD card reader. And some people have GoPros, which don't have SD cards. They have micro SD cards. And then some of you want to take the video and broadcast it. So we have an HDMI port. So meet the new revolutionary MacBook Air. USB-A, USB-C, SD, micro SD, HDMI, and earphone jack. Once again, <laughs> Apple has revolutionized the world, going where no other computer has gone before. And that's why you pay 5,000 bucks for a laptop from Apple. Well, you forgot enclosed what? in aluminum. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. It's, it's a virgin L, L, I can't even say that. It's, <laughs> Aluminium. It's, <laughs> it's version that metal, you know, and, and the case was made by chanting Tibetan monks. And oh, yeah, you know, we've noticed through our extensive empathy for our customers at Apple that sometimes you trip on the power cord. So we made this thing that if you trip, 
the cord comes out before it pulls your MacBook off the table. And we've also noticed that people need to charge their MacBooks. And sometimes they close it. And sometimes they want to look from across the room in the middle of the night in a hotel. So we made a little LED that shines when it's charging. So this is the revolutionary new MacBook Air 2013. I swear, I swear it's because Tim Cook, he's on his Gulfstream 3 and his personal assistant charges his personal assistant's MacBook. And so... If he ever takes a picture, he hands an SD card to somebody and magically it's in Apple Photos. And, you know, I, I, am I missing something? I mean, do you, don't you wish you had all those it's, ports? I, mean, I feel I your don't pain. think it's too much to ask. I feel your pain because I bought the M1, the first M1 MacBook, and now I just have the two USB-C and I don't even have the, the magnetic. So I trip over it all the time. <laughs> you, I, I, I hate to tell you, but your dongle needs a dongle. Yes. Well, this is why we have seven other episodes, because all you said is exactly what we quoted in the other episodes. So. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I'm being redundant? No, it's not to get someone else's perspective. But, <laughs> yeah. but you know what? It may be that we're the only three people in the world who care about this. Maybe, you know, the other 100 million people don't care. They just want, they could just go. Remember when they made a MacBook with one USB? See? Yeah. Oh, my Lord. Yeah. Like, what were they? Yeah. I mean, I don't know. it would be, you know, well, if, if Apple were making a car, they would say, well, we've noticed it 95% of the time people are in the car by themselves. So the Apple car, revolutionary car, only has one door. <laughs> and, and that's why we're great. Of course, if Apple made a car, it would be screamingly great car, but you could only go 50 miles before you charge it, right? <laughs> and, and, and you couldn't go to the Tesla charger or the Electrify America charger or the ChargePoint charger unless you bought the $2,000 dongle adapter that goes into the standard charger. Yes. Yeah. But optimally, we have a special kind of electricity that's proprietary to Apple to charge the battery. <laughs> that sounds about right. That's good. Uh, I got to uh, tell you, you know, I, I used to be a Mercedes-Benz brand ambassador. So I have an idea of how difficult it is to make a car. The thought that Apple would make a car is just beyond me. Because, yeah. you know, when your MacBook crashes or your MacBook freezes, and, you know, there's a little report that says restart or should I send this to the developer? But when your car freezes, you die. I mean, it's a big <laughs> difference. It is a yeah. big difference. Yeah. So but on the other hand, you know, Tesla has proven that. So what if the fully automated driving doesn't work? I mean, <laughs> it's not like the driver is asleep or playing games or checking his text messages. <laughs> <laughs> oh. oh. So let's let's talk about your podcast. So what what caused you to start this Remarkable People podcast? I'm a huge fan of listening to all the episodes. It's awesome. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm on a mission to make people remarkable. That's how I explain it now. Because I, I, It took me two years to figure out that positioning statement. Well, there's two answers. So there's the insipid, materialistic, plastic, soulless answer. And then there's the other one. <laughs> So you want the insipid one first or the real like good one? I want the good one. Okay. The good one is that I have been in tech and in business for about three or four decades. I've met a lot of people. I've learned a lot of things. I made a lot of mistakes. So I think that I have the ability to not only get to very remarkable people, but ask them questions that a typical journalist or a, a podcaster or a former you know, wrestler would not ask because I have been there and done that. And so I think I have a moral responsibility to help people become more remarkable by interviewing remarkable people for them that they probably could not get to. And I think that the quality of my podcast will not be fully appreciated until I die, but that, <laughs> that's just the way it is. Yeah. So that's the Sandra Bullock beauty contest <laughs> answer. Here's the other answer. So, about four years ago, I had a new book called Wise Guy. And as an author, you basically go on any podcast that'll have you, right? I mean, I would go on estheticians podcast if they wanted me. So I'm in LA and I'm talking to this business podcaster and I'm like curious, right? So I say, so 
how does this work? He says, well, I record people like you and other famous people. And I put this out weekly. And I say, so what's your revenue model? He says, well, I sell ads. I say, so how does that work? He says, well, there's three ads, pre-roll, there's mid-roll and there's post-roll. I say, well, how much do you get for those? He goes up, pre-roll, 20 grand, mid-roll, 15 grand, and 10 grand. So I can add 20, 15, and 10 and get 35. Is that right? No, that's not right. Oh my God, 45, 45. So I get 45. So I say, so you make 45 grand per episode and you do this 52 times a year. He says, yep. I said, so you're telling me you're making roughly 2 million bucks. He says, well, that's conservative. And so after I pick my jaw off the ground, I said to him, so why am I writing a book every three or four years, getting one payment, the advance, never having any more opportunity to monetize it. So it's either a hit or it's not, but it is determined right then and there. While you make 50 grand a week, like what am I missing? And you, you sit here, well, this is before the pandemic, but now it's even easier. So now a podcaster just sits here and hopes he has a good internet connection. He doesn't get his butt on an airplane, fly, set up, try to make sure the room is quiet, the air conditioning is off, the construction across the street is not on. You know, Now I just have to make sure I have a good connection and the movers aren't bringing in any furniture. That's not <laughs> as hard as moving, right? So I said to myself, guy, what's wrong with you, guy? Why are you a writer? You should be a podcaster. And so that's the day I decided, you know, I got to look into this thing. There's something to be had here. Of course, I can't tell you that I make 50,000 bucks an episode 52 times a year. In fact, right now, I don't know what my revenue model is, <laughs> but I am loving the shiitake sandwich that I'm eating. There you go. There you go. That's what it's all about. Yep. Well, uh, that's not what it's all about. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Want to make some money too. <laughs> yeah, that helps. Uh, well, I love your advice about prototype now. Seek forgiveness later. Were there times in your life when you prototype too fast and failed? If so, uh, which failure is your most memorable? Well, you can make the case that any company you start or any product you start that doesn't succeed, you prototype too fast, right? <laughs> but, <laughs> but. Yeah. Um, I, I guess my message is that if you're going to err, err on the side of getting stuff out too fast. I, I don't think that the key variable is where you start as much as how fast you revise once you start. Now, at an extreme, obviously, if you put out an absolute piece of crap that no one is ever going to touch, let's say you wanted to start a conservative social media platform with a congressman from central California, and you put out this really sort of suboptimal thing, you know, that may be unfixable. But if you, I think if you put out something that's adequate and then you fix fast, that's the best formula. And so that is a very important lesson that you can ship too early and have something that you won't embrace anybody. And you can ship too late where the world has passed you by. So the key is to ship, endure the pain, and fix fast. For founders who are bootstrapping a company, when should they entertain the idea of raising angel investments or venture capital versus wearing out their boots? Um, right before they go broke. <laughs> so I, I, I think that is kind of an artificial question in the sense that it's not like you have a lot of options, right? It's not like yeah. you're sitting around and you say, to yourself, yeah. huh, today I could write 100,000 lines of code. I could close a $5 million purchase order or I could go raise money. <laughs> See, what time is it? What should I do today? The, the life of an entrepreneur is not serial. Yeah. It's not I raise money, I program, I sell, I collect, I go public. Yeah. A life of an entrepreneur, and they need to realize this, is parallel. So you are recruiting, you're programming, you're selling, you're supporting, you're begging, you're raising money. You are sucking up to influencers. You are trying to tell your family to cut you some slack. You are you're doing everything at once. You are pushing 10 or 15 projects and functions down the road at the same time. And if you cannot wrap your head around that, keep working for Bank of America, keep working for McKinsey, because you're not going to make it as an entrepreneur. 
That's a great answer because both of us have full-time jobs and yeah. obviously Swift App School is our passion. We found that we found it years ago and started teaching kids uh, in the summer through our summer camp. And yep. I think that's been great. And it's been a temptation for us to say, all right, let's just jump out on our own. Who cares what our wives think? Let's just go, <laughs> let's just go out here and raise a bunch of money. And, and obviously that's a very risky. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's very risky. And who am I to analyze your risk tolerance? But I think that there will come a time, if it's meant to be, that it'll be obvious. You know, now we can go from moonlighting side action gig to all in. Yep. And I think that that will be fairly obvious. Mm -hmm. And until then, you know, keep revising things and revising things and fixing things until you hit that point. Now, I think it's also fair to say that, you know, you want to have a full-time job and you, this is your passion slash hobby that you hope to make some money off of. So that is okay too. I'm not condemning that path, but people need to stop reading entrepreneurial biographies and autobiographies and drawing what they think are statistically valid conclusions from them. Because the stories you hear about are highly selective and highly, highly not scientific. So, you know, the fact that Steve Jobs didn't go to college doesn't mean that you should quit college. Right. And the fact that, you know, Bill Gates dropped out of college, or if he did, I forget. You know, that doesn't mean you should drop out of college. And, you know, if some venture capitalist says, oh, I, I look for two people in engineering degrees who are, I don't know, you know, make up a story, right? So the fundamental flaw with that is that you only hear about the success stories. So it may be that only Steve Jobs and someone of Steve Jobs' enormous, remarkable talent could have succeeded without finishing college. The odds of you being him again are low. Or it could be that, you know, really college is not that necessary, but it's very dangerous to, you know, take a few data points. Did LeBron James finish college? I oh, think so. He skipped college. Yeah. He, yeah. So, okay. Great. So, you know, you shouldn't say, okay, so LeBron James skipped college. That's the path. I'm going to skip college and go straight to the NBA. Yeah. Yeah. Well, buddy, you know, you might have a torn ACL in your first game. And then what are you going to do? Mm -hmm. Right. You're going to what? Well, first of all, it's not clear that you can get to pros without playing four years of college ball unless you're a LeBron James. But even if you are a LeBron James and you decide to go that path and you tear your ACL, the next thing you know, you know, you're the doorman at the Ritz Carlton. I mean, so now having said that, I also understand the power of a hero, right? That LeBron James gives hope, that Wayne Gretzky gives hope, that Steve Jobs gave hope to people who were the nerdy college dropouts, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So I just sort of conflicted with myself, but it's a complex world. What can I say? <laughs>One of the topics that we've talked about on our previous episode is diversity. Yeah. And obviously, uh, when Bob and I went to WWDC in the past, he pointed out to me, I wasn't going to talk about it, but Bob said, where are your people at? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they all look like me. <laughs> and uh, so why do you think Silicon Valley has been so slow to embrace the idea of more of a more diverse workforce? Well, you know, we're going to go into an area where it's not all unicorns and pixie dust. <laughs> you sure you want to pursue this question? Because you know, I think what the past few years has fundamentally proven is that American society is fundamentally racist. You, I don't know how you can argue that it's not racist. And so, you know, that I interviewed someone from my podcast who said, you know, racism was invented in order to justify slavery, that it's okay to make people slaves because they're of a race that is inferior. And that's, I think, to overcome. And so 
I, I don't know. Maybe that's a long way from why there are no black people <laughs> at WWDC. But <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's kind of the roots. OK, you'll love this story. So yesterday, two days ago, I interviewed Neil deGrasse Tyson and I asked him about this. And he told me that to this day, when the airlines say, OK, first class can board and he gets in the line and then he's about to put his stuff in the overhead in first class. Flight attendants come up to him and say, this is for first class only. Wow. Mm. This is Neil deGrasse Tyson. <laughs> and, you know, OK, maybe I'm being overly dramatic, but let's just say highly probable it's because he's black. Right. I mean, let's just be honest. Yeah. Right. And that's today. And that's the Neil deGrasse Tyson. So my whole take on this is that creating a great product or service or great company takes great people. Great people are in short supply. So what you need to do is to have as large a pool to draw from. So just completely rationally, why would you say I'm going to restrict my genetic pool to people who are male and white and probably went to an Ivy League school because they're a legacy student? That to me means that now you're in the six foot end of the pool and you're not looking at anybody in the eight, 10 and 12 foot end of the pool. So why would you not take a black woman trans if they, he or she, whatever is the right way to refer to this person is a world-class programmer because there are so few world-class programmers. Why would you eliminate that person? <laughs> yeah, it's such a complex world now because I know that regardless of what your belief is, there's always a tendency to say, I only want people like me. Well, and I, think I mean, if that's your logic, well, I can't see how that can work. Even if you're Steve Jobs, if you say, I only want people like me. Well, what does that mean, Steve? You only want people who don't believe in any process, any documentation, any stability, any, you know, it's, it's, it's not like you're all sunshine and roses here. So if everybody was just like you, Steve, who would actually make the product? Who would support it? Who would debug it? Because you, you are the best ever at inventing the future. But somebody, you know, this is the old story about um, two people go hunting and, you know, they decide that one of them is going to go catch the bear and the other one is going to kill and cook the bear. So the first one goes out and he starts running back to camp and the bear is chasing him. And he says, OK, I got the bear. Now you kill him and cook him. Well, that's two different skills. <laughs> it's two different skill sets for those two people. Yeah. Yeah. And so was needed a jobs and jobs needed a was. Exactly. I have a question about something that I think is uh, something I struggle with, which is how do you manage work-life balance? You don't. I think that the concept of work-life balance is an overrated myth, just like finding your passion. Uh, listen, my experience is that there are times in your life you have to be all in. When the Macintosh division, I was, let's see, I was about 30 when I was in the Macintosh division. I was all in. It was denting the universe, making history, living my life in fear of Steve Jobs, trying to change the world. I don't think I could have raised a family then. And you know, now that I have a family, or in my 50s and 40s when I had a family, I don't think I could have been all into the Macintosh division. And now that I'm 67, you know, I have a lot of time, but I have other interests. And so I think that maybe over the course of your life, if you add up all the experiences, it can come out to be a good balance, you know, so the family and career balances, but it's because you were way career for a while. And then you were way family for a while. So it averages out, but it's never that you were always at the mean the whole time. I, I would be astounded if that's true. Okay. Something I need to uh, 
digest. <laughs> <laughs> buck up, have, young I, man, buck up. <laughs> by the way, I have four children. <laughs> okay, well, good luck. So, I have four uh, children. Yes, I know. <laughs> Mine are 18 down to uh, 13, and then the uh, last one is now five. So she's the one that uh, came much later. How so, old is she? She's almost five, the youngest. <laughs> and how many boys and how many girls? All girls. Oh my lord! Yeah. Forget it. If you just, you just <laughs> I'm surprised you can be on this podcast right oh, now. Oh yeah, I know. <laughs> Never a dull moment. You have four girls. Yes. Yeah. That's like so, having 16 boys. Well, I have a T-shirt that says, "You can't scare me. I have a wife and four girls." <laughs> Got it for Christmas. You you are <laughs> you are in estrogen overload, man. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is sort of a segue to really to our next question, which yeah. is uh, Bob and I realized that most of our accomplishments wouldn't have really been possible without the support of our wonderful wives. So yeah. how has your wife helped support your own entrepreneurial journey? Well, listen, you know, a lot for quite a few years, I was traveling extensively and yeah, she ran the family. She was the chief operating officer of this family. And uh, so now I figure I owe her a few decades where <laughs> she can go hiking and camping as much as she likes. So I, I think that, you know, behind every successful man is a remarkable woman. But behind every remarkable woman is probably not a remarkable man. <laughs> <laughs> well, is there anything else you would like to add? That's, that's all the wisdom I have. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for being on the podcast today. Uh, we really appreciate it. I'm a big fan of your podcast and appreciate you being on ours. It's just such an honor to have you. Thank you. Thank you. So I, I hope everybody listening out there, if you want to learn from people like Steve Wozniak, David Evans, Stephen Blank, you know, technical people, as well as people like Jane Goodall and Neil deGrasse Tyson, man, there's only one way to go. <laughs> It's remarkablepeople.com. Yes. Yes, definitely. All righty. I'll say yeah, one other thing. I'll say one yeah, other yeah. thing before we go. My first introduction of you, I think I mentioned this in our last podcast, was um, when I watched the Mix 08 conference. And you were, you, you <laughs> with, were, with uh, yeah, with Steve Bomber. Bomber. <laughs> uh, and I was like, oh, this guy's amazing. I love it. <laughs> you mean <laughs> me or Bomber? You were amazing. <laughs> I was, I was just, I was just cracking up at all the the responses you had for them. And uh, this was the time, of course, I work in IT, so I yeah. was dealing with all the Vista issues. Yeah, yeah. And so I was just loving it that he was getting somebody to, you know, <laughs> knock him down for all the things Whoa. that I was dealing with. <laughs> we were meant to be friends. <laughs> yeah. You said something in your email about um, you loved our mission. Yes. I just love your mission. I hope you dent the universe too. Awesome. Thank you so okay. much. I appreciate okay. it. Bye-bye. Bye. All right. Bye. So what do you think of that interview, Charles? That was amazing. The fact that we were able to have Guy Kawasaki on the show is pretty amazing. And like we said before, having him as the first guest yeah, that's great. <laughs> I'm not sure we're going to be able to top that one. That's uh, that's a very good first guest on our podcast. And just so many great nuggets of wisdom that he shared. I've, I've been rereading his book, uh, The Art of the Start 2.0. And it is such a good read. So if you have not read that, you should definitely go out and buy it. Like I've said before on this podcast, please go listen to the Remarkable People podcast. It is amazing. They've got so many wonderful guests from lots of different perspectives, and, and Guy is just fun to, to listen to. So I highly recommend that as well. Yeah, you convinced me to, to uh, listen to his book. I tend to just do audio books, but I'm, I'm so compelled with listening to it. Now I'm going to go buy the book. Because I want to, mm -hmm. you know, I like to mark up, highlight parts that are significant. And I keep finding things in the course of an audiobook. I can't do that. So it's not often I actually want to get a physical book, but I'm definitely going to be picking his up. So thanks for that recommendation. It was really great to have somebody with a wealth of experience come on and really help us to know how to focus, even in our little niche, 
in terms of giving back to students and trying to figure out how to make this a scalable business. Because we care about the mission more than, you know, the business. It's not about making money. It's about changing the world, like you said. And obviously, we want to impact more people. So in order to do that, you've got to scale the business. <laughs> and so I'm, I'm excited to learn what we've learned from reading his books and from having him on the podcast. You know, it's, it's been a while since I've read a book that I felt like I'm in college and I'm taking notes and I'm frantically writing things down because that's that's how I've been this entire time reading it. It's just been really great uh, just to, to take notes and and learn so much at the same time. And then to be able to interview him, <laughs> it's just a home run. So very nice. I'm so excited to to have our first guest be Guy Kawasaki. You know what else was really cool about the interview is that he brought up HyperCard. Uh, remember when we went to AltConf that year and we got to meet Bill Atkinson? Yeah, that was really cool. I think he was showcasing his uh, photo card app. Yeah, that's right. And I guess he was, you know, talking about HyperCard in his days back at the uh, Macintosh and how revolutionary HyperCard was at the time that it really opened up the doors for people to be developers that weren't traditional programmers. So that was really cool. So I'm sure Guy knows Bill Atkinson or knows of him. Uh, yeah, and, and Bill, as I recall, like wrote that entire photo card app in Objective-C. I mean, I remember him talking about it. And so that was, I mean, of course, he's written a lot of other programs. So that's pretty cool. Thank you for listening to today's episode of the Swift App School podcast. You can always find us online at swiftappschool.com. And we're also on social media at Swift App School on Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, YouTube, and Facebook. Bye, y'all. Goodbye.